In this video, I want to wrap up the electron transport chain by talking about oxidative phosphorylation, chemiosmosis, and ATP synthase, and sort of drawing out the complexes themselves. Now, what is oxidative phosphorylation? Just as a sort of definition, it's basically using redox reactions to power the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. And how do we actually do that? Um, we do it via establishing what we, we mentioned earlier, an electrochemical gradient, right? Specifically a pH gradient, right, with the H pluses. Um, now the reason it's called an electrochemical gradient is because a chemical gradient just describes the idea that have that if you have a membrane and you have more of one thing on one side than the other, then you have a chemical gradient. But now in the case of H pluses, right, um, those are protons, they're charged, they have a positive charge. So there's an electrical gradient as well, which is described as a voltage, there's a difference in charge, there's a charge separation. So that's another basically sort of um, aspect of the gradient itself. Now there's this idea of chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis is basically the movement of ions down their concentration gradient through a selectively permeable membrane. So in this case, what are we thinking about for that ion? We're thinking about H pluses. Uh, ATP synthase, what is ATP synthase? It's the protein that makes ATP. So it's going to be a pretty cool protein. Okay, now what does the electron transport chain kind of look like? Let's kind of think about it like this. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have four different protein complexes. We have complex number one, we have complex number two, we have complex number three here, and then we have complex number four down here. So you have four protein complexes, and then over here at the end, we got good old ATP synthase. So we're going to see how how this is how the, how this electron transport chain actually works. So if this is the outer mitochondrial membrane here, and this is the inner mitochondrial membrane then the electron transport chain is along this inner mitochondrial membrane. These are protein complexes along the membrane. So anything inside here is considered the matrix, and anything out here would be part of the intermembrane space. So if we think about this, uh, what's, what's happening here? So initially we said we had NADH come to complex number one, and then it's reoxidized back into NAD+. And then complex one, we said pumps protons, and it does. Now, uh, in in you know biochemistry books, you'll probably see that complex one will pump four protons. So for every two electrons, you get four protons pumped into the intermembrane space. So these protons are building up over here in the intermembrane space. Um, and these protons are coming from the matrix out into the intermembrane space. Now, what is this blue line I've drawn here? I've drawn a bunch of different blue lines. This kind of looks like a mess. But if you see a blue line, a blue line is electron flow. So this here is electrons flowing here. These electrons are flowing here. Any blue lines you see, those are electrons flowing, which is the purpose of the electron transport chain. Any pink lines you'll see that describes proton movement or flow. Okay. Now, in this case, it's against their gradient, right? So, at complex one, we know that NADH is oxidized back into NAD, and we have proton pumping. So, that's what's happening at complex number one. And in addition, these electrons are flowing from complex one over to complex, um, actually, they don't flow to complex two, they flow over to this Q thing here, which is coenzyme Q. Um, succin the uh, excuse me the complex number two where we turn succinate into fumarate on the matrix side of the um, mitochondria or the uh, matrix side of the inner membrane. This occurs at complex number two, and the electrons flow to co coenzyme Q. But notice that I have not drawn a pink line here going into the intermembrane space because this complex does not pump protons. Then once we have coenzyme Q, the electrons from coenzyme Q go over to complex number three. 
and then to cytochrome C. Um, and notice complex number three actually pumps protons as well. It pumps four protons as well. So we have four protons there being pumped into the intermembrane space. Cytochrome C then gives its electrons to cytochrome A. Cytochrome A gives it to, which is, I mean, which is part of complex four, which gives its electrons to oxygen, which becomes water. So we're going here from oxygen. We're starting off with one half oxygen, and we also add. If this one half of O2 is just an O, right? So if that's how we get this O in in water, so we must have added two uh, protons in addition to two electrons that are coming from here. So basically, in addition, this uh, complex number four, which I almost forgot, also pumps uh, protons. But in this case, it actually only pumps two protons. Why that is, I'm not entirely sure. I actually even just read an article recently about how maybe complex one doesn't actually pump four protons. It might only pump three. So I think these numbers sometimes still might be, you know, biochemists are still trying to figure them out. I'm not really totally sure about that. Um, but in any way, the point is that they all do contribute to the proton gradient, uh, except complex number two. So notice that we're building up a proton gradient here, both by pump we're pumping protons through these three complexes, but in addition to that, we're also uh, we're basically we're increasing the H plus concentration in the intermembrane space, which I'll abbreviate as IMS, and we're decreasing the H plus concentration in the matrix. Well, how are we doing that? Well, first of all, we're taking the, prote the protons out of the matrix, right, to dump them into the intermembrane space. So that's one thing. But another thing is that these protons here, right, are being picked up to make water. So this also lowers the H plus concentration, right, in the matrix, which can also contributes to further establishing the, the, the concentration gradient, right? So this, this, this makes the matrix less concentrated while these three, um, make make the the intermembrane space more concentrated specifically by pumping the protons over there. So what do we end up having? What well, we already mentioned that we have all these different protons now in the in the intermembrane space and very little out here in the in the matrix. So what's going on? We have here you'll notice that I put these little plus plus charges or plus signs uh along the membrane of the in, as far along the um intermembrane space side of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Because of all these protons here, we build up a, a relatively positive charge. It's relatively positive compared to the inside here, the matrix, where we have these negative charges. Because there's more positively charged molecules or more positively charged species with the protons on the intermembrane space side than there are in the matrix. So now all these, these protons, they want to come back in, right? These, these protons want to come back in. They're just waiting for their opportunity to, you know, to come back in. They can only come back in through ATP synthase. Now, ATP synthase is a um, has has an FO region and an F1 region. The FO region is basically the um, the proton channel. That's what allows the protons to flow through. And then the F1 portion is actually the ATP synthase portion. That's the portion that actually makes the ATP. So Basically, what ATP synthase does is it allows it allows these protons right to flow through this channel here back into the matrix down their concentration gradient. And when that happens, that is a spontaneous process. So that spontaneous process powers the production of ATP from ADP and phosphate groups. So we're making ATP here. So you can see now why establishing this proton gradient was important. We needed this gradient to, to be formed so that they can spontaneously come back down their gradient through ATP synthase. And ATP synthase harnesses that energy to power the production of ATP. So that's essentially what's going on with the electron transport chain. That's how we, we make our energy. Because basically we went from... We went, went from um, let me write, write this up here. We went from NADH and FADH2, right, um, which were, you know, stored, reduced energy forms. And then what we did was we, we took that and went through redox reactions, right? And those redox reactions were, were 
exergonic, right? And they they power the establishing of this electrochemical gradient, right? So electrochemical gradient. I'm gonna I'm losing space here. Uh, the electrochemical gradient and that electrochemical gradient, right? All of these basically this is stored energy here. This is you know free energy that's being released in these redox reactions that powers the production of this electrochemical gradient. All these energies, they're stored energies. But we can't use those energies. Those are not the energy currencies that we use. We use ATP as energy. So basically what we did was we took the energy from these different forms, took this electrochemical gradient, and used it to make a usable oops usable chemical energy. Right, which in our case is ATP. It's pretty gnarly if you ask me. I think that's awesome. So I hope that was helpful. Hope that cleared things up. Um, thanks for watching.